thank you. This is a nice crowd for tonight. Um, this tonight uh, is going to be a discussion, I hope, about what I call the uh, hidden uh, rules about art making and art presentations. Uh, for me, I think it's very important to discuss these things um, in the sense that I can find that uh, they can become very limit limiting either in our own uh, production but also in limiting uh, the individuality of the artist in general. So, uh, this lecture will is uh, in two parts, more or less. The first part is about why I don't believe in objectivity. So, and this goes about why I cannot believe in the, the kind of the teaching of the truth or this kind of hierarchy of power kind of thing. And um, then the other one, I'll just like what I find are the mythologies or like the accepted notions that are not supposed to be questioned generally about art. Uh, I found that um, the way to, to introduce this is basically you know, why did I get interested or why did this lecture come about? Just basically it's more or less like why um, basically what happened to me is when I became an artist, which is basically 15 years ago, I just went, you know, my, my older brother was also an artist and I saw him bringing stuff home and then I just started to you know, kind of do after him and it was always a question for me to know am I doing art because it's what I want or am I doing it because he was doing it first so but anyway and then I went into a sea jet and I remember quite clearly that one in, in some of the first assignments there um, the teacher had asked us to do something and in my head I just thought, well, yeah, I have nothing to say. <laughs> and uh, so it's like and this, this feeling of like, you know, my starting point is I have nothing to say. And that went on for years and for years and for years. But if I look back, you know, I do have this production of painting, of sculpture, of drawing. So I was able to to produce things, even if it was, it was nothing personal. So when I went to Holland, which was a basic, a very big break from all my uh, system of support, I became more aware of, of some of these attitudes. And that's at that point that I, I said to myself, well, if I was able to function for so many years without any feeling or without any, you know, uh, personal input, it must be because I was following some guidelines, you know, because I didn't have to think, I was just following this very strong structure. So, um, this, so, and that's when I was in Holland, my, the first years basically started to be about uh, questioning the medium, because I was really like a painter, a sculptor, a drawing. And slowly I say, well, why make a mark on a paper? And why use paint after all? Um, it's like one of my feelings was like that maybe the best way to, to, to make a drawing is to take a pencil and to try to punch a hole in the stone with it. You know? But for years we've been thinking that the best way is to make a line on a piece of paper. You know? But actually you should just punch a hole in the rock with it. That's the best drawing there is. So, um, anyway, the, uh, when I talk about uh, a belief in uh, objectivity, uh, when I look at my education in uh, general, you know, when you talk about the technical, so you talk about the rules, like the golden, the golden rules of composition or of colors, and in the same in art history, they're more busy teaching you who did what, when, than teaching you why, or trying to relate, you know, to the social control, or what was happening then, or what they, they wanted to do. Uh, so they always thought, and you know, when I was in art school, there was always a right and a wrong, somehow. You know. There was never a, a, a book about making art somewhere, you know, but somehow there was this teacher, and he was there, and he, you know, he, he could tell me I was doing it right, or I could 
he could tell me I was doing it wrong. So there was always this, this very strong concept that there is this objectivity, there is this, this you know, power about being right and being wrong. Um, so how I, why I don't really believe in a kind of uh, objectivity is um, how if I look just basically the, the, just into the concept of interpretation, of, take, you know, of looking at an artwork and what happens there. And I start with basically the, uh, that this interpretation will take part in a certain context. So, and for me to, to, to talk about an artwork in a gallery is different than to talk about an artwork which is in a museum, but to talk about an artwork which is in a public space or which is in the classroom with the teacher present. Um, it's the same thing if the artwork is a present from a friend, if it's hung with a magnet on the fridge, um, that all the, there's no like, the context um, will affect what you are going to say about the work. If a teacher is there and you're in the classroom, there are certain things you are going to say. If you're alone with a friend in the museum, then, other, you know, the artwork will, can be <coughs> looked at in a other separate way. Uh, if the work is from somebody you know you have interest in, then you'll be much more kinder. If somebody you hate, <laughs> then you just kind of throw it down. So I can I, I cannot separate you know that there's this universal context in which artwork exists, and that's for me is the the outside out there context, um, and then there's the inside context, which I would call uh, part of it is your frame of mind, but basically how many art history books you have read, how much knowledge do you have about artworks. Um, like one example is when we look at the uh, Black Square of Malevich, you know, which was made in, in 1915. So, you know, if we see the, the Black Square of Joe Schmoe from 1960, I'm going to say, yeah, you know, that's nothing. But then if we find one that was done in 1822, you know, a new black square, then wow, you know, it's like this new discovery, you know. So the amount of knowledge, the amount of book we bring, <coughs> and it's the same thing if you're in a crib and, you know, you have to go to the toilet, you need to go to that very fast, or you have a hangover from last night, or again, it's a friend, or somebody you don't like, you know, so, um, or if you would just rather be on vacation, you know, you're fed up of being here, you just want to go home. So, I mean, all these, for me, all these mental conditions are also going to affect what you're going to look. So I don't see that there's a possibility of having one way of looking, because depending on how you feel, then you will see different things. Uh, personally, I always relate it to a kind of, in a personal life, in a family situation. Like when you're uh, you're with a friend, you might use certain words or certain language. When you're doing business, you're going to use certain words or certain language. When you're with one member of the family, you can, some subjects are going to come up and some others are not. If there's, you know, the whole family like Christmas, then there's another behavior that can come. Kind of but who can say that when you are the most, the real person? For me, these are all different facets of who you are. So I, can, I cannot say that I am more myself now here talking to you than when I am myself in my, the, in my family, where there's no communication, for example. Or when I am alone by myself writing to myself. So I think for me it's the same thing about in relation to an artwork. I cannot say that there's this one ideal or this one universal condition where there is an artwork. I just think that the, the context outside, where you see it, when you see it, what time of the year you see it, will affect your interpretation of it. And also the knowledge you have about it will affect it. Um, so, for me, why, if for me that is so obvious that we cannot have like one interpretation or one reach to an artwork, um, why is there for me this illusion of objectivity? Why, what, what is this based upon? Um, I see it that 
basically, uh, it's all about uns unspoken rules or unspoken like guidelines. Like, if basically you're from the same culture, then you will have been taught more or less to react the same thing. And if also you have the same vision, you know, of the same family upbringing and stuff like that, then most likely you will also react the same way to an event. Uh, one example of, of this, what I call this illusion of objectivity, is if, by example, if I take a book and I put it on the table, and then I ask you, you know, is this a big book or a small book? Well, then it's, well, more or less now we can agree. You know, is it is it a clean or is it dirty? Then we can still more or less agree because there's still these notions. But you know, if we just push, if we don't stop there, if we just push, you know, is this literature or is this garbage? Is it worthwhile? Is it good or is it bad? Then this this ideal of objectivity just falls apart. You know. So as long as you just skim the surface, as long as you keep within like these cultural definite or boundaries, then you will believe there's this objectivity. But it's actually, if actually you just go further deep into and into, you just see that there is as many point of views as there is as many people. And even as many people who is not the same at night or in the morning in a classroom or in a family situation. So even at that point, even if you're one person, your interpretation will also keep changing. So, um, if then for me we cannot talk about evaluation of, of uh, objectivity, um, what I find then, what I find is possible if we want to talk about an uh, artwork and things like that, then it's more that we will do a, a comparison of different system of evaluation, so that I'm by it's 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 not a it's you know um, how can I say that there's all these subjective worlds, subjective reality, and all we can do is just you know listen, see how one works, and just listen and see how the other one works. Um, at this point, I think I can um, that. Because since everything is subjective, then there's no concept of better, but like of one being the truth and the other one, so one playing the teacher and the other one playing the student, of one being right and the other one being wrong, because there's all these alternatives. I think what can be used and what is often used is the concept of adapta adaptation or adapter. So basically, is, is this object adapted to the use I have for it? And for example, then you can take a car, because a car is adapted for, you know, more or less adolescent human use, but it's not adapted for an animal, for a dog, or for a baby. So I think that if you want to speak of relation between things, you can think about the concept of adaptation. Is this thing adapted to the needs I have of it, to the rules, to the guidelines, to the definition that must be there for it? Uh, so I see adaptation as, as a, let's say, part, partly shared subjectivity. So basically they have some element in common which makes it fit together. But still it's not a sign of objectivity, it just means that there's some partly common denominators, like within a culture or within a family, there are some conventions which are there. So for me, that when one person tries to interpret an artwork, then he is in effect asking himself how many correspondence exists between what is there and what are the conventions he has learned. And that for me is what the interpretation of an artwork is. It's basically you have this thing there and then you have all these convention rules you have learned and then you basically try to fit you know, is this product adapted to my definition of an artwork? Um, in this, and then in this sense, that's when I start to speak about the convention. So, if I don't see this objectivity or this artwork art there, then I will say, well, what are then the conventions, the mythologies that exist today that we use to define an artwork? 
what are these things that we're looking for. And I think that the first thing, um, the, the first um, interaction, I would say, exchange that we expect with an artwork is what I would call is, is an act of contemplation, which means you're just going to stop and look at the damn thing. That's, that's important. You just don't pass, you just kind of stop and you just kind of, you know, look at it. Uh, and, but at this point, you know, that's still bigger than art because there's still religion fits to this or looking into nature or music. But most of our daily routine of what we do in life is already thrown out. You know, just this sitting down and just kind of focusing Thing. Um, a second component is that an artwork must have a, a, a body, a visual body. You know, it, it must be there. Um, this has changed in the last, uh, let's say, in the last 100 or 50 years with, you know, the yeah, kinetic art, conceptual art, environment, performance, and video art. But there, like, you must be able to establish a contact with something that is out there. So, that's on, not only you must just sit and do nothing, but also you must have something to gear your attention to. So that, that's also very important. Uh, another thing that's very important is that it must be displayed in venues for artworks. So it must be in museums, or in galleries, or in places where, where artworks are to be seen. And one uh, of the uh, extension of that is that if an artwork is to be exhibited uh, in a place where there's no, no art normally, then you'll have a lot of publicity telling you that you will have art to be seen there. And even more, then, if it still gets confusing, then you will, part the, you will add the word art to the event itself. So it's performance art, it's video art, or land art, or environment art. <laughs> so it's very important that you know that you're going to go see art. <coughs> so that's, that's also very important. Uh, another uh, component is that it must be put in space to promote contemplation. You know, so basically it must be somewhere in the middle of a wall or in the middle of a space. You know, it cannot be cluttered in a room. It must, it must have like this special aura of something apart where you can go and contemplate. Um, and you see that, you know, in, it's almost like the museums and the galleries in a way, almost become the poverty of that, where all the signs of everyday life is taken away, and where for me it looks more like a crazy house than something that has to do with art, with feeling, with, with personal. You know, it's, it's it's. But so this, it's that's another very important thing. It must be isolated from everyday life experience. It must be like placed alone somewhere. Um, Another component, which is very, very important, is that an artwork cannot be anonymous. You must know who made it. You know? And if you don't know who made it, then it's going to be attributed to a school, or to a century, or to a style, or even, you know, there's the whole joke, you have the card, and it's written, anonymous. You know? So you must know who made it. That's, that's very important. Um, and this too, how, how so important, you know, two examples of how so important that has been so far, is like the concept of the signature, you know. A finished artwork is, on, a work is only finished when it has the signature. You must have your name on it, it must be there. Or if you look in uh, collectors or galleries, you know, or Sachi and Sachi, which is basically what they were doing, when you say, you know, you go and I say, well, you know, I'd like two Rauschenberg and 
and a wobble in the blue tent because my sofa is discolored. And uh, you know, uh, this guy, this name has such value now, so you know, I pay 2% of that. Kind of. So, like, whatever you do, you must have a brand name, you must have a name somewhere. Um, and one last but crucial thing is that whatever you're showing must have its letters of reference as ours. It must be stamped, baptized, that it is an artwork. Because you won't know you're going to see art unless you know an art is there. So it must be stamped, you know, this is art. And why, and this I expand a bit, why I find, why we have this lead to, to, be, to have the stamp, I see. And then, then for me I put it back to the educational system, where you go to school, you don't go to school to go think, to learn how to think, but you go to school to learn what is right. And you don't learn what is right by being right, you learn what is right by making sure you're not wrong. So you're learning, you're learning actually not to be wrong. And you're also learning that it's wrong to be wrong. So, you, so then you don't go, then life at that point can become like a slalom of trying to avoid being wrong as opposed to finding your own path and just being right all the time. Uh, and you know, to the point that you're not, <coughs> you're basically taught not to trust what you think, not to trust what you perceive, not to trust what you sense. So, and that's where, this is also part of the lecture, I find a problem, so that if today, you know, somebody goes into a museum and he sees an artwork, and it's in the museum, and he doesn't feel a thing or understand, or he just doesn't care for the damn thing, he just say, well, you know, it must be art, because it's there, it's in the museum, you know. And, um, what I, what, and what that part, what I find is difficult about that, is that um, often if, if a person is put in that situation, where there's no communication or no, you know, no experience or whatnot, then often because of this, then we are, um, uh, often the person will start to feel bad, like he's doing something wrong, he's not understanding. So he can either become aggressive towards the thing, or he can say, oh, this stupid art, it's, it's nothing anyway. Or he just kind of avoids music and things like that. And there, that's where I find as an artist that's a problem situation. Because this, all these kind of myths and need to have to stop is just basically keeping people away you know, from the experience. Um, and for me, I always make the parallel that if you put me in front of a computer, and you ask me to make a program, I'll just go, ah, I don't know. And that's that, but I won't start to feel stupid or, you know, bad. But put somebody in front of an artwork, and that's under the, one of the mythologies, it's like you're supposed to understand. You know, and if you don't understand, then you think there's something wrong happening here. And I, I just find that doesn't help anything. So, um, Two, oh yeah, two other ones which I find very uh, important is that generally an artwork must be useless. It mustn't have a use because if it has a use, then it becomes design, or it becomes craft, or it becomes architecture, or whatnot. So basically, an artwork must be useless. And finally, our artwork must be expensive because if it's not expensive. You know, you're going to think there's something wrong here. You cannot trust it. It must be a fake or, I don't know, something like that. Um, now, basically, when I make all this, this list of these things, it's not, for me, this just, you know, this just basically describes the mentality of the Western culture. So, within this culture, these are, like the mirror, the same rules that is going to be used specifically to the... Uh, artworks. And why I, I like to talk about this and why I find it's important is that for me, if you follow this guideline, then you are going to have an artwork with no concern about who made it, what was his intent, what is the feeling, what it looks like. All of these things don't matter. 
Because if you, do, if you follow all of these things, you will add an art word. Because, and that's, that's where I find is the, the strength and the destructive power of, of this guideline. Um, what, in kind of conclusion, what I'd like to say is that when we come confront to, to, to look at an artwork, then I say that there is no objective base to start from, that there's no way to talk about a thing separated out there from us, because it's air. And at the same time, that even if we say, no, it, it is separate, it has nothing to do, then even what we, the words we're going to say and the concept we're going to use will be culturally defined by the same stance. So then for me, if I see this situation so strongly, then that um, if I cannot talk about the artwork as a thing out there, because there's no objective perception of it, um, I think that the only way to um, be able to discuss the experience of an artwork is by describer, describing an artwork no longer as a thing, but as a particular type of relationship that you set up between the participants and whatever is around you. So for me, an artwork that is, is not a thing out there, but it's more described as a process, as an interaction, and where, which is an interaction where the sum of its part is more than what was there to start with. So there's you, there's whatever there's out there, and the process, the interaction, then that creates something much more, which I would call the art experience. So I wouldn't call it as something out there, or something in me, but just the interrelation. And as soon as you take that apart, as soon as you analyze the thing, then it just falls apart, because the relationship is not there anymore. Um, one parallel, where I find, you know, for me, where I try to to find meaning in art or to find understanding is <coughs> basically as trying to find the love between a mother and a child. It's a relationship. It's not in the, in the mother nor in the child. But it's the togetherness that creates it. Or another way is trying to find consciousness within the brain. So, and this relates to my other lecture, which I have next week, which I say that what keeps, uh, for me, what gives meaning is the interaction between the thing, like the, the, the man walking on a tight rope with a stick. Basically, that if he stands still, he's going to fall down. And if he moves his stick in all directions, you know, with no concern of whatever, he's also going to fall down. So the only thing that keeps him, keeps him walking along is the constant flow between the static and the non-static. And for me that's where also art resides, between the constant flow between what you experience as yourself and what you see out there. So that's my vision, and that, that's the guidelines which I find very dangerous. Thank you.